Um, so thank you so much to everybody that's joining us today. It's wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, my name is Dr. Rose harris Bertil, and I'm editor of the Open Library of Humanities Journal, or OLH as we call it here, uh, and I'm managing editor across the suite of 28 open access journals that we have at the OLH. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you here today to this webinar on open access and medieval studies, where we're going to be discussing new approaches to water and beyond. So uh, we're incredibly lucky to have our panellists, Dr. Hetta Howes. Uh, hello, Hetta. <laughs> Hetta's waving to us. Um, and Dr. James Smith. Hi, James. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have them with us today to discuss this collection. So we'll be listening to some talks from Hetta and James before we come together for some general discussion. And we'll also take any of your questions at the end in the chat facility. So please do stick around at the end. And any questions that you've got for our experts, I'm sure they would be delighted to answer. Um, so before we launch in, I'm going to give a short introduction to this very special collection of articles uh, with the OLH that inspired today's webinar, and also a brief introduction to the Open Library of Humanities more broadly, and then I'll hand over to today's speakers. So to introduce the Open Library of Humanities then, well, we're an open access publisher uh, and we're academic led and we have no paywall for readers. So all of our journals are completely free to access anywhere in the world with no article processing charges for authors. And we're really proud to be completely free to read and free to publish. Now, at the OLH, we believe that free access to scholarship is particularly invaluable to help researchers, students and the public access knowledge from anywhere in the world, whatever their circumstances. We live in an age of information, but as we're all finding out at the moment, it's also an age of misinformation. And so open access helps to redress this by making rigorous scholarship accessible to all now, and in the current climate, I think as institutions are locked down and entire populations quarantined, as we know, open access to knowledge, I think, is perhaps more important than ever before. Now, in order to make our own open access publications possible, our costs at OLH are funded by a consortium of nearly 300 libraries across the globe, which we're incredibly grateful to. And you can find out more about this on the OLH website if you're interested in joining us. Now, the OLH was founded in 2015, and in just five years, we've established a platform of 28 peer-reviewed open access journals whose scholarly articles have received over 360,000 downloads worldwide up to the end of 2019. Now, to give you a bit more about uh, information about our flagship journal, OLH, this is a rapidly growing journal in the humanities with a very international readership. In 2019, we received 180. 18 article submissions from 31 countries and our article submission to publication time so the amount of time that it takes from submitting the article to actually seeing it live uh, was 238 days in 2019 uh, so around seven to eight months from start to finish now, at the Open Library of Humanities Journal, I think our special collections are one of our greatest strengths. And these allow specialists in the field to provide specially curated content from within their areas of expertise and lead guest edited publications that make cutting edge interventions in the field and open new directions for scholarly innovation. Now, on the 25th of April 2018, Dr. Hetta Howes from City University of London and Dr. James Smith from University College Cork launched a special collection with the OLH journal called New Approaches to Medieval Water Studies. Now, this specially curated and guest edited collection aimed not only to showcase the state of play in the field of medieval water studies, but also to consider its possible future directions. Now, almost two years later, the collection has received over a thousand views and has helped to inspire a new collective of medievalists inter interested in water studies from a range of different disciplines. Now, today's webinar is both a celebration of the OLH Journal uh, and also to be able to connect with everyone today virtually, a celebration of what technology can do to bring us together, but also a chance to conceive of new watery pathways as our speakers reflect on what is new in medieval water studies and share their editorial experiences of working with an open access scholarly journal. Now, this event is also a celebration of the growing relationship between medieval studies and the OLH, and we hope to give a warm welcome to more scholarship in this vibrant and exciting field.
So, to introduce our first speaker then, uh, Dr. Hetta Howes is a lecturer in medieval literature at City University of London and is interested in the relationship between water and gender in devotional writings for women. So, thank you very much and over to you, Hetta. Thanks so much, Rose, um, and hi everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's really nice to see some sort of human faces and get some human interaction in this odd week. Um, it was also an excuse to get out of my pajamas for the day, so thanks for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the journal edition that James and I did specifically, and then he's going to talk a little bit more broadly um, about the journal and about medieval studies. So I'm a lecturer um, at City University of London, but I was at Queen Mary when I met James a few years ago. I was doing my PhD um, on water in um, medieval devotional prose for and about women, um, and particularly how water is sort of functions in those works. And James was just finishing up his PhD. Um, we were put in touch, I think, by our supervisors, and we've been working together on and off ever since. Um, he's my accountability friend. Um, I always get stuff done when I work with James. Um, so, as I said, I was looking at kind of um, late medieval devotional prose and the idea of spiritual exchange and how water is a way of communicating different kinds of relationships with God for women. And James um, was working on his amazing book, uh, Water and Medieval Intellectual Culture, Case Studies from 12th Century Monasticism, where he thinks about water as an intellectual framework. And I think that's where we sort of found our common ground. We realised that we were both interested in water, not as sort of a catalogue of interesting tropes, um, which is, you know, one way of thinking about water, but we were more interested in water as a kind of means or method of communication. Uh, not just a message. So how water, th thinking um, with water as Chen and in the influential volume put forward rather than thinking just about water and kind of saying here's an interesting bit about water and here's an interesting bit about water but how could we use it to sort of frame experience. Um, so that's what kind of brought us together I think to work together um, and we still are working together in various ways. Um, we didn't quite know what we wanted to do at first. We knew we wanted to do, sorry, that's my doorbell. <laughs> I think my partner will get it, sorry. Um, so uh, we knew we wanted to do a publication. We didn't quite know what yet. Um, so we were talking through kind of what we wanted to get out of that kind of publication. We knew we wanted more people involved, <laughs> obviously. Um, and that was partly because it's nice to work with more people, but also because we wanted whatever we produced to be both multi and interdisciplinary. So in 2014, um, Richard Hoffman um, sort of lamented the isolation that often happens amongst specialized disciplines. Um, and he um, sort of criticizes, and I quote, the collective habit of medieval studies to treat material culture as an afterthought and the non-cultural as non-existent. So, he was sort of frustrated by a lack of dialogue between both sort of humane and scientific investigators, and also by the lack of conversation between humanity scholars, sort of historians, literary people, eco-critics, environmental humanities, um, and sort of saw that um, things weren't moving forward because of a lack of conversation. So James and I knew we wanted to do something that tried to bridge those gaps. I think we were successful in some ways and have work to do in other ways. We knew we wanted to kind of create um, a snapshot, if you like, of the state of play. When we were both um, working on water, we knew lots of other people who were. There was sort of new and exciting research being done. Um, it felt like a sort of timely moment um, to think, sort of try and bring people together and think more um, concretely about what we were all trying to do. We knew we wanted it to involve early career researchers um, for a number of reasons, but I think the main two, well, we were, we are early career researchers. Um, precarity, often I think early career researchers can get left behind or left out of big projects, um, particularly if they're not in sort of full-time jobs. Um, and also new ideas. I think often early career researchers are coming up with the more sort of newer and exciting um, ways of thinking through and about um, new areas of scholarship. So we wanted it to capture um, as much UCL work as possible, which we definitely achieved. Um, and we wanted to not just spotlight current research, but think, as I said, towards a new approach, or I think perhaps better put new approaches, um, because it was never our intention to try and sort of impose a way of thinking of 
thinking with water on anyone, but to kind of gather together what people were doing and see if there was a kind of umbrella way of thinking about that. So in the same way that you have digital humanities, you have the environmental humanities, could we have a water studies? And I suppose that was our first question. Can we have that? So we wanted to kind of see if we, we could sort of think through a community of practice. Um, and as I said, quite central to that idea was um, this idea of not just having a catalogue of tropes, but thinking through water as a framework. And we wanted finally to be alert to water's own agency. We didn't want it to just be a kind of human centric um, approach to water, water and humans, although that is personally the work that I do. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there was also space for thinking through water as an element with its own agency um, and a unique ability, I think, to disrupt boundaries, to cross disciplines, to connect. Um, there's all kinds of fun words if you're writing about water that you can use. I think my, my supervisor when I was writing my PhD was like, this is fine, but let's cut out all the puns now. I'm slowly putting them back in for my bit. Um, <laughs> so we knew what we wanted to achieve. Um, but of course we needed to figure out who we were going to work with. I think we knew by that point that an edited collection was a good idea. An open library of humanities seemed like the perfect forum for that. James was already familiar um, with the open library of humanities. I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that um, in, his, in his talk. It seemed particularly useful because we wanted to do quite experimental and speculative work. So um, our introduction, for example, is as much a our introduction is as much a think piece as it is kind of um, anything else and we wanted a forum that would be open to that kind of thinking. We wanted research to be readily available and particularly again for ECRs. I think it's a real problem in our field when you finish your PhD and you don't necessarily have um, an institution anymore and suddenly you can't get access to any resources. So how are you supposed to continue with your research and then it becomes this horrible catch-22 um, which of course is part of what the strike recent strike was about. And we wanted the sort of rigor and apparatus and infrastructure of a traditional press, but with slightly more space and room to experiment and do what we wanted to do. Um, and OLH definitely <laughs> delivered that um, without trying to sound too much like a, a flag bearer for OLH. It was such a great experience working with the journal. We got a lot of exciting submissions. The editor experience was very smooth. The infrastructure was very usable. And it was really quick. Um, and I don't mean quick in that the work or the thinking was necessarily quick, but the process was, you know, obviously traditional presses can be super slow. Um, and what we could also do, what OLH journals allow you to do that other presses don't, is a rolling submission. So people who got kind of through, got their writing done a bit quicker, or the, we got the reviews back a little bit quicker, we could bring out their essays. They weren't having to wait ages and ages um, before they could get their work read. So the second kind of part of my little spiel, I just wanted to kind of introduce those essays to you and, through, and in doing so kind of spotlight the kind of work the collection does. If you haven't gone to read them, you can, because it's all online. <laughs> so um, that might be something to do in self-isolation. Um, so we had an essay from Rebecca Pinner, which investigates the fenlands and causeways of the famously soggy East Anglia. And she kind of thinks about how, whilst to outsiders, people not familiar with that, landscape those in between spaces might seem kind of treacherous and unforgiving and scholarship often seems to suggest that um, but actually for those who were intimately acquainted with that landscape who worked in it lived in it grew up in it it was a place that could offer and i quote prayer safety and munificence um, so she's kind of trying to read the landscape as a sort of medieval person living in that time and in that way she's sort of making old sources new which i think is really exciting she hadn't found sort of new sources where someone living in East Anglia um, and praying to a saint reflected in a really useful way on how they felt about the landscape but she was reading those existing sources through a watery lens um, to make some really important steps in um, in the research around the area and how it relates to saints lives. We had an article from Sophie Harwood um, who thinks about the connection between women water and warfare in crusade literature. And she reveals the kind of potential for water to both mirror misogynistic tropes on the one hand in the sort of crusade literature, but also, and I think this is really crucial, its potential to disrupt masculine space. Crusade studies is often quite a traditionally male um, space and she's thinking through in her essay, 
quite reflectively um, on how water studies can disrupt that um, and sort of make room for um, more feminist scholarship. Had an article from Andrew Richmond, um, which shows how water in the medieval landscape actually shapes the narrative of his Arthurian source text. So not just how it figures as a metaphor, but how it's actually lending itself to the very structure and narrative. Um, these rivers, tarns and seas that act as a nexus between various different Arthurian texts um, as they lay claim both to the bodies and to the narrative. Uh, one of our most read essays, um, Lucy Kempfer, uses water as a tool to read Chaucer. Um, and I, I really like that idea. Chaucer obviously is one of the most worked on medi uh, medieval authors, um, but she's kind of trying to use water to think differently um, about him, uh, using humoral theory to show how liquid metaphors offer a kind of material conceptualization of emotion. Um, so we're kind of already just running through some of these, we've got kind of emotions history, environmental history, uh, narrative theory, um, and then of course we have James's essay where he thinks about bodies and networks as flows of energy and interrogates the tendency that we have to think about water in terms of power and he kind of identifies water as dominant as a dominant energy carrier in medieval thought and thinks through that idea. Again a really nice speculative think piece that might have been sort of harder I think in a, in a traditional press but I think we were able to be a lot more um, speculative and experimental than we might otherwise have been able to do. Um, and we end with a manifesto, um, some of the observations for moving forward. Um, and of course, this is partly um, a webinar to think about how we might move forward. And I think some kind of, not gaps, but things that we might want to think more about, and we are sort of still working on this, with um, trying to establish a bit of a water collective at the moment um, with a group of ECRs. I think we could be thinking more globally um, and about the sort of connection between the modern and the medieval, um, how maybe understanding medieval underst attitudes towards water might help us think about water in our own time and um, the face of various different um, sort of climate, well, climate emergencies. Um, and also I think Hoffman's um, criticism that the scientific and humane investigators are not talking to each other enough is still somewhere where um, work perhaps needs to be done. It was quite difficult to get scientific contributions to our call for submissions. So I think one, one sort of challenge, if you will, is how do we kind of bridge those gaps? But I think James is already doing so, you know, might have some ideas about how we might do that. Um, I think part of it is just where you kind of advertise in a way how do you get the right kind of researchers um, reading the right stuff and I think if there's going to be any site to do that then it's going to be open access and um, where you kind of stumble across things that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise and I think that's all from me actually um, I think I'll I'll hand over to Rose to introduce James or just hand over to James yes, yes. <laughs> thank you Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Heather. That's fantastic. Um, uh, so I'm now going to introduce our second speaker today then, uh, before we move on to questions for both of our speakers at the end. Um, so Dr. James Smith is a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of English and Digital Humanities at University College Cork, working on the 2019 to 23 Ports Past and Present project. Um, and his work is at the intersection of the blue environmental, spatial and digital humanities. So thank you, over to you, James. Hello all, um, and thanks Heta for that, that introduction to our collection. Um, uh, as, as was already said, I think we're all, we were both very pleased by the, the um, range of essays that we got and I think you know, I think we're at over 1300 views across the collection now. So we've got a, a good amount of traction and, um, you know, and it's, and I think they're well read and, um, and I think importantly, I think they're very discoverable. You can easily, you know, they, because the Open Library of Humanities journal is connected up to things like Crossref, it comes up in your, you know, in Google search as well on Google Scholar. If you have an ORCID, like an, uh, your research your ID, it comes up on there. So it's very easy to get it out there once it's been published, as well as, as Heta mentioned, the rolling publication deadline. So I think, I guess what I'd like to reflect on a bit, um, now that you understand what our kind of, our ideas were, 
is that how we benefited from the sort of infrastructure of what we did. Um, what I thought I might do is um, start off by dumping a little bit of further reading uh, into just the message, uh, the chat here, because there's some really just a bit of a few interesting readings about, you know, medieval studies and open access, including the fourth of those lists, uh, those items, which is actually a list that Ulrike Kavutka, who is a digital humanities, um, you know, data management person, but also a medievalist by training, uh, has compiled a list of open access medieval studies journals. So essentially, I think it's interesting that we, we come in to OLH at the time that we did, because now, as well as our collection, which, um, you know, as, as, was, as has been mentioned, we're very happy with how it, how it sort of came about. There's also some other collections in the OLH journal. There's one called The Medieval Brain, that's about neurohumanities and medieval studies that shares a sort of, you know, experimental speculative dimension that um, we were trying to bring out as well. There's also another new approaches, new approaches to late medieval court records, which has a lot of essays in and it's very, and it was obviously for the editors an excellent way of getting a really big conversation about their topic out there. And also one of the really early collections of OLH, um, authors, narratives and audiences in medieval saints lives. So, you know, we're not the only, you know, and I think there might be a couple of other essays that aren't associated with the collection. But I guess what I thought I might do is, uh, well, firstly, you know, um, Hetta mentioned our manifesto. So I thought I might just read that out and, and think about a, a couple of the items from it and think about how open access and publishing with OLH kind of helped to encourage that. So for one of our first item, which you, you, you'll see, I, I put the links to the introduction and to the collection in the chat. Um, a new medieval water studies requires disciplinary agility. And I think to have agility of discipline, you also to some extent have to have agility of publication and efficacy and a good sort of infrastructure. And as Rose was discussing that the, the funding model for OLH allows for really high quality equipment and tools of publishing coupled with, you know, good peer review, good time, you know, a fast process but also without any need to pay article processing charges. I think to be agile and to be an early career researcher specifically who is being agile, you need the tools to do it. And sometimes I think when you're getting to that point, if you're finishing your PhD, if you're in the first few years of early, you know, after your PhD, you do need to make an impact relatively quickly, get your work out there, get it read get it, you know, get it to the people that, that need to read it. And, and I think having that agility of publishing as well as, you know, a place to be adventurous and agile with your, you know, disciplinary mixture, your experimentation is really important. And I mean, broadly speaking, in the environmental humanities, for example, there's other open access journals emerging that have spaces to do that kind of work. As my bio might have suggested, I'm very invested in places, communities of practice where a lot of different methods and disciplines come together and publishing is a crucial way of creating those spaces. But we also said, for example, as Keta said, applying hydrosocial or medieval hydrosocial insights to 21st century problems, that means it's got to be as open and as readable as possible. Just as in the case of, you know, if we're talking about, uh, we're in this weird place now, and one of the links about viral open access from Vincent van Herven Oy, um, that's in the list I'd put, is a recent publication about, it, isn't it strange that suddenly all of these for-profit publishers are temporarily making their work open access? They flip the switch, they'll flip it over again when all of this is over. But for now, for them, really, they want to be the good guy. But couldn't this, this strange utopia that we find ourselves in where JSTOR have made all of their articles available and all, a lot of the press books are available, you know, this, don't we want more of that? Don't we want to encourage a world where people can take medieval insights and apply them to their 21st century problems? And it needs its own methodological discourse, a self-aware medieval water studies. And we need spaces to do that, open and readable, shareable spaces. Um, and then, you know, we need to acknowledge our power to make critical interventions through 
um, illiteracy and scholarship of gender, comparative cultural studies, diverse and multilingual medieval worlds of water. Once again, we need an accessible world of open access publishing to do that. But I think that what it all comes down to, I've written down here where I said, why publish an OLH collection in medieval studies? It supports ECRs. It gives power to ECRs to publish, to make decisions, to have agency and control over their publishing, their editing decisions, ECRs as editors, but also ECRs as authors. We, we need self-determination. We need to be able to, you know, um, have the tools to make those kind of interventions without large budgets, which realistically are never available in the humanities, but are least available to those in the precariat, those who are in, you know, just getting started in their careers. And as I said before, top quality digital infrastructure without an author facing fee, scholar led publishing. So being, being able to talk, you know, uh, with people that are, you know, oppressed that's by scholars and for scholars to work with academics who are the editorial officers who are holding the offices in these, these publishers to have that community of the, we can actually do it ourselves if the right infrastructure is there and have people that will help you to get the best out of you, yourself as an editor as well as as an author and get great, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, sense checks and uh, get developmental editing from people who actually can really engage with your material and uh, you can have a more personal experience as well, I think is really important. It's just, um, in the Radical Open Access Collective, um, which is a group of scholar-led open access uh, publishers, they talk about scaling small get good at a small scale you know be able get small and medium-sized publishers to be able to do it all you know you don't there doesn't have to be a sort of differential of of what you have available to you and your size you know big doesn't have to be better um and as i said the same you're using a lot of the time it's the same peer review as you would have picked for another journal it's a process that you know like it's it's a nice friendly to use, you know, um, uh, a publishing online publishing system. It's a good system. You, you know, invest in people, invest in editors and their identities and their, their sort of um, position, invest in your authors, invest in a different type of prestige that's not based on the hallowed sort of titles of publishing, which I know in medieval studies, a lot of us are very, uh, you know, invested in and for, for, for varying degrees of good reason. But, um, but you know, invest, invest in other forms of, you know, accessibility and uh, prestige and reputation and, you know, take a, take a chance on something a bit different and give people the tools to do it. And like I said, it is genuinely a very pleasant experience to work on that scale. I mean, we're often used to working with small publishers. You know, a lot of our book publishers are very small in medieval studies. So I'm sure many of you will know what I'm talking about, but it is possible to have open publishing that's also intimate and, you know, approachable and has a sort of feeling that you're being supported. And as, and I mean, if I, if I must be frank, a lot of the larger legacy publishers have outsourced all of their workflow to the extent where it's an abstraction. A lot of the time you feel like you're talking to an email template or a, a bot a lot of the time or the people, you know, like it's, it's become a very impersonal experience. A lot of the time, the workflow for some of these big publishers, and it is okay to have community in the publishing community, that link between author and editor that in the past, has been more active than maybe it is today. And that we, we have all had a hint at in medieval studies, I think, with the kind of publishers that we tend to associate with or publish with. Um, I guess I'd like to end as well by thinking, there's an interesting conundrum that the cost of your publication can't necessarily solve. And um, it's, it's an interesting, so this is, I'm just raising this more as a sort of talking about open access in medieval studies as a sort of topical thing. Um, it's the problem of like manuscript permission costs. I mean, we, a lot of us rely on extremely expensive manuscript fees. I mean, Catherine Rudy, who's published open access, couple, quite a few books now with open book publishers. There's a Times Higher Ed article I put in the uh, webinar chat. Um, but she talks a lot about, she, she publishes 
a lot of images in art history books and like the costs are just mind boggling. But that is something that, you know, in, in, in the, the umbrella of open science, more, more uh, cultural heritage institutions are starting to make their images more open. So hopefully if we invest in this kind of open publishing, there'll be eventually more of a convergence between open access, openly licensed images and open access, openly licensed uh, publication. I mean, just for example, like it's happening, like BNF Gallica, where there's a lot of manuscript in images, that's all public domain now. You can get like the, the BL has a huge collection of, you know, so things are moving along. My, the cover of my book is an open access image from um, the Walters, I believe. You know, so things are moving along. But I think that if we invest in this kind of open publishing, um, it helps us to have more of a space to talk about some of the other openness problems that we have in medieval studies. Um, and also, in, uh, you'll, you'll notice in one of the links that I've shared of Ulrika's uh, website, um, I'd highly recommend having a look at some of her material if you're interested in open science and open scholarship talking about medievalists and research data and that there's some some uh, discussion of that in there but i i suppose just just to sort of draw to a close i um i think that if we're going to be able to find these spaces to have like conversations that are difficult to have that are often a sort of a bit of a risk for us if we if we want to be able, you know, we don't want to have to play it safe necessarily. If we want to be um, not, we don't want to be afraid to try new things, but also not ashamed if we, you know, run into some kind of structural barriers. If we want to break out of a sort of a system of patronage that forces sometimes our hands in how we publish an early career. Um, if we want to have some kind of autonomy, these are the tools that we need to do it. And that's the thing I find the most empowering. And I hope, I mean, as an author, because I've published with OLH, as you heard from Heta, I, I've, I'm an editor and I've edited for OLH. But I think feeling empowered at that stage of your career is one of the most important things you can possibly encourage. And in order to do that, you need a way of paying for the resources. And in order to pay for the resources, you need to find a model that is going to be sustainable and nourish both the author and the community but also the publisher which is why i'd encourage you to look at the sort of scholar-led uh, consortial publishing models where a little bit comes from lots of different institutions and it all gets put into a big sort of pot that is then used to pay the direct and indirect costs of research for different articles so i think rather than talking anymore what i'll do at this point is i'll i'll uh, stop talking and then we can start our q a brilliant thank you so much for that james that's i think you've given us so much to think about there and also i think uh, just on behalf of her late thank you and also thank you heta for all the wonderful things that you said about us uh, that's that's really wonderful to hear and we do put an awful lot of time and effort into making sure that our authors are happy our editors are happy because that's the lifeblood really of open access is everybody kind of pulling together and doing their bit and i particularly liked what you were saying about the idea of kind of the small collectives the communities the small communities that are working really hard to make these things work so thank you for that um, Oh, I can see we've already got applause uh, from Martin in the comments. So everybody that's listening, if you've got any questions for James and Hetta, uh, I'll start the ball rolling with a few, but please do post any questions that you can think of uh, in the chat. Oh, we've got our first one here. So a question that's come up, it says, why do you think that medieval studies in particular has embraced OA? Many historical subfields have been very hostile, fearing the loss of their traditional venues and exclusivity. Okay, good question. So, uh, James, Heta, would one of you like to, to address that at all? Jump in, go for it. I could, I could say one thing, which is that I think that like a lot of fields, medieval studies in, is pulling in two different directions. So I think there are a lot of people like properly embracing open access and medieval studies in books. And, but at the same time, we are um, like a lot of smaller subfields of the humanities. We're very 
we have very close relationships with our publishers. We don't want to see um, small publishers, you know, that are relying on a you know traditional format. We don't want to people don't want to like kill them off. We we're also often very beholden to particular book series or particular journals, uh, you know, and that that's an understandable thing. So I think the medieval there are there are medieval studies is part of that humanities objection to things like plan s the sort of european plan to, to mandate open access so i think there are i think it is important to consider some of the sort of quirks of the humanities but at the same time i think i personally as an ecr as a researcher have staked that I, for example, I've set up a little manifesto for myself that I, you know, I don't peer review for non, uh, you know, fee-free open access journals. I, I try and publish three gold open access, you know, um, articles for every one of any other kind. I, I have a set of, I have a code and I kind of forced that code on myself because I thought it's very easy to sort of drift along in, in fields, like especially relatively small fields. Um, so I think that it's both. I think that we, but I think people are listening and I hope that, you know, I, I think there's just more and more every year to offer as well. Yeah, I think um, it's a really interesting question why medieval, because I do think um, in terms of like digital humanities and also kind of getting resources online. I mean, James was talking earlier about other sort of openness problems and um, I think, the field of medieval and early modern studies actually have been really good at trying to get stuff online and i wonder if that's part of the reason why we're quite interested in open access as particularly you know as medievalists is that um there are lots of restriction problems for us often you know can you get to the right library can you um you know how do you learn um paleography if your ma didn't offer it um but you want to do further study um and often kind of open access courses or kind of um digital databases are the answer to that and i think maybe there's just perhaps more restriction and therefore we're more invested in it but also as james said so i'm you know i'm kind of bringing out a book with Boydell and Brewer soon it's not you know I am still working with sort of non-open access um publishing but it's a press that's sort of you know owned by the employees it's a it's a really you know great experience to work with them so it's kind of finding a way to kind of avoid the sort of sort of big powerhouses I think <laughs> and um stick with the more community presses but yeah it's a really interesting question we do have some proper, I would call them like craft industry publishing in medieval studies where they've been going since the 18th, 19th century, like Breppels, who I published my first book with. They've been going since like in some form or other since the 18th century, publishing pamphlets. Um, they are they are very niche and they're very specialist and they provide a thing that a small set of people absolutely need. And there are, we do have people, a lot of as in publishers like that in medieval studies where they're small, extremely niche, extremely craft. And we, we, we work with them. They're part of our community. So I guess we have a bit of a, you know, we, we, a bit of a double thing going on. And I think that part of that's understandable, but other parts of it, com uh, there's plenty, especially journal publishing. There's a lot of room. And I think it was with digital humanities and a lot of the resources that are coming online, there's an increasing push for open resources that are also niche and also craft and also small scale that are often scholar created. So I think, you know, I think it medieval studies has deep roots and that's a problem, but it's also part of our identity and what, how do we negotiate that? You know, and a lot of our, uh, there's a lot of legacies to our history that are problematic. There's a lot of them that are slowing us down or holding us back, but also like with any proposition like that, it's, it's a conversation that, you know, every, every field has on its own terms. Thank you both. Excellent responses there. Uh, I've got a, another one in the question and answers here that's come in. It says, challenge of small craft or bespoke publications is perhaps cost. Creating these one-off artifacts is expensive, but obviously valued by the field. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say, do, do either of you want to come in a bit more on that? Or should we feel free to, to if there's anything you'd like to comment on there? It's an interesting story because it's actually a story that's been going on for ages. So like on one hand, uh, one of the people that mass produced the Patrologia Latina, like the Latin church fathers, you know, like 
a printed version was a guy, I think, like Minye, who was a Jesuit priest, and they called him God's plagiarist because he went around aggressively finding all this material. And it was a subscription service for clergymen so they could get hold of a library and super niche. But this guy went aggressively, went and sourced all this material, cranked out these volumes and sent in that had a sort of mail order. So in a way, we, we have an interesting history with that. And then, of course, you know, one of the first digital humanities projects period was by a Jesuit called Roberto Busa, who did a concordance of um, uh, Thomas Aquinas back in like the 50s, I think, you know, with punch cards from like World War II era computer technology. So we've had an interesting double connection with the digital, the open, the the, on, the online, the offline, the easily available and the, the, the limited. Thank you. Uh, and Heta, did you, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that at all? No? Okay. Um, so moving on then, we've got another question that's coming from Bethany. Uh, says, Heta, you mentioned the difficulty of bridging the gap between the humanities and the sciences and how open access can help. And can both of you maybe talk a bit more about that? How might water studies in particular offer us a framework or language for genuine interdisciplinarity? I like that, the idea of a framework or a language coming out of this. Um, would either of you like to respond to that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I suspect Bethany, who's asking, um, would have some good answers herself. She does work with um, the Canals Trust, I believe, um, just also um, finished her PhD, uh, excellent PhD. Um, so yeah, I think water, there's lots of things that are every day and there's lots of things that kind of can be thought of in a sort of literary, historical, scientific, etc. mode, emotional mode. But I think water, particularly because it's both the most ordinary and mundane of elements, but also the most potent used in sort of ritual, um, often associated with sort of healing, good luck. You see it in sort of every religious text, you see it um, in kind of superstitious practices in everyday life, that it has both this sort of orneriness and power um, that both kind of material and metaphorical, that mean it's a really good nexus for sort of conversation between huge amount of disciplines. I mean, when I first started um, thinking about water doing my PhD, um, I contributed a few times to um, a water week in Sussex run by artists Claire Whistler um, and Charlotte Still, which is still going on today, um, just won an award. And it's where there's sort of uh, creative people, scientists, researchers from different fields all coming together to talk about different aspects of water. Um, and it, it just kind of really blew my mind how this sort of one really simple, but life-giving thing um, can be thought, thought through through all these different disciplines. Um, so it feels to me, I'm sure there are other, I'm sure other people would come in that are studying other things and say, well, you can do that with this too, but water, and particularly, I suppose it's um, agility, you know, um, its ability to be, sort of represent lots of different things in metaphorical ways, but also, um, in, I mean, I work on medieval encyclopedias and they have this idea that um, water can kind of be anything and it disrupts boundaries and it flows and it moves and it kind of um, gets where it shouldn't. Um, so I feel like it's a really useful tool um, for thinking through that. But I wonder if, James, you've got more of a sort of perspective on how, how we can kind of talk more with the sciences through water. I think it strikes me that, you know, like if we're talking about the idea that there's no separation between na you know, nature and culture and the idea of socio-nature where there's this kind of series of arrangements and practices between like human impact on, on environments and then their, their impact on humans and these like multi-generational behaviours and practices of interacting with land. I think that to understand any of that, there's got to be a multidisciplinary conversation. And I think that's increasing. I mean, like uh, Heta mentioned Richard Hoffman, but there's plenty of other people doing it now. Like, I mean, Dolly Jorgensen with animal studies, for example, like in science and technology studies. There's a lot of interesting medieval studies work showing that, that they can't be separated. And to have that conversation, you've got to create a space where a journal will take a chance on that kind of publication. And I guess also just like, in terms of public humanities, I don't think, I think, I think it's fair enough to say you can't really do public humanities without open access. Like I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's a non-starter. So I think in order to be effective, 
at, at being public uh, public humanities, whether it be blogging or writing for for news online publications, or just making your your workday peer reviewed publications openly accessible. I think the two have to go together, and this is what gives you the tools to do so. Brilliant. Thank you for that, James. Um, we have another question here. Uh, so Amy has said, thank you so much for this webinar. Thank you, Amy. You are welcome. Um, and I wanted to, she says, I wanted to pick up on Hetta's point about moving to think more globally. Uh, do you think that open access makes this more possible by removing some traditional restrictions and barriers? So any thoughts? I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, I think, um, you know, if we continue to think about water, water literally connects us. And in the medieval period, which is obviously our period, it, it was the main way of getting around, you know, couldn't fly about, um, <laughs> etc. cars, you know. So, it, you know, in terms of kind of connecting countries or islands, then water is the way to do it. Um, and I think um, now, of course, the big connector is we're all kind of experiencing right now today is the internet. Um, and we wouldn't be having this webinar right now in sort of our sort of, unofficial lockdown <laughs> because it's still not really been called that but it, it obviously is um this is the way <laughs> this is the way that we can connect so i think um there's much more chance um to be global i think the key though and i think i was maybe hinting at that this in my talk is how do you get what you're doing to the right channels and into the right places and i think we have to think quite creatively about that because um you know you, you know how do you say say we wanted to make this webinar more global how do we go about doing that um you know it's still rel you know relatively domestic i suppose um so yes i do think um it has potential to really make a difference but i think we as sort of creators editors authors need to think about how we get our work into the right spaces to create those relationships more globally and of course, there's the language dimension, which I mean is 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 a thing across the, like you know the whole of academia of um, allowing people the ability to publish in their own languages or simultaneously. I mean, there's big big discourse in medieval studies, like huge in French, German, Spanish, Italian, you name it. You a lot of medievalists end up like roaming across you know European languages, particularly to find all this stuff. Um, and it's important to be out there are language communities within medieval studies and um and i think i mean i know olh has had supports like multilingualism so maybe maybe like rose could say something about that as well because i think that's something i know that i i think that in terms of globalizing that's something that's crucial as well yeah, I was just going to say on this, um, I mean, I can see some points coming in in the chats here that completely agreeing with you on the public humanities and open access, uh, says Ernesto. Martin says, good channels metaphor for water studies. Nice pun there. Um, but it's brilliant. I really appreciate the way that you guys are not just coming from a perspective of a particular discipline and talking just about the discipline, but actually talking about how that intersects with the wider field. And I think that that's actually, it, it sort of shouldn't feel like a radical act and it's strange that in this day and age it is to instead of just go you know because we, we could have done this you could have just spoken purely about uh water studies and you know the, the kind of the field from the insider perspective which is really important as well but you're also making really important steps to join this up with open access the work that's being done the work that's needed the different communities that are coming together on this and i think actually having this kind of uh, sort of i don't know slightly more 21st century approach to our disciplines as not just sort of standalone uh sort of entities comprised of experts but actually that do link up and and are hugely affected by the climate for ecrs i mean that was something that you touched on earlier as well that's particularly important the idea that actually open access is really embedded in the conditions that we've created and the conditions that we find ourselves in but also it, it's sort of something that's bigger than any specific discipline and i like the idea that you were sort of saying about actually can we create a water studies that goes across disciplines because maybe we're going to have to start thinking in those kind of ways moving forward um, I can see on the on the Zoom webinar chat, uh, we've also got, I think Amy says, thank you, you're very welcome. Uh, Ernesto says, could I ask James and Hetta to comment on their views on the tensions or synergies between, say, uh, mode, open access and content? 
uh, so as in medieval water studies in this instance. So what do you guys think the affordances are for researcher led open access journals to go beyond business as usual disciplinary content regardless of mode of dissemination or licensing or is advocacy uh, implicit by going or is advocacy implicit by going for open access? Either of you want to step in on that? That's an interesting one. I think if I'm understanding it correctly, um, I suppose it is, it's true. Is it, is it like, should, should we, cause I guess business as usual would be that basically like, you know, the, the discipline takes precedence over the mode. And, um, whereas, you know, maybe oh, if we're saying, you know, we're advocating for our open access, does the open access kind of, was that the primary motivator rather than the discipline? But I guess we're in a, position now where we need to normalize like ba like normalize the idea of open access for, that everyone can have it in a particular form and that there needs to be a plurality of ways of getting it but um we're not really at that normalization stage i feel like you know you do basically have to be an ad advocate in order to commission and publish um, open access and as i said to make the choices to publish there it it does still take a certain amount of ad, ad advocacy so I, I i think we're a long way from like what i would classify as normalization but i'm not necessarily sure we want a new business as usual i like the idea that things are constantly in flux but at the same time just you know well understood dissemination channels are like cr are crucial to to reading and to, to managing the overload of sort of information that we're presented with. I know that's a really sort of off piste way of like answering that question, but that, that was what I thought of when you said it. So. Yeah. And I'm, I'm also going to sort of loosely <laughs> interpret the question, I think, but I'm kind of, um, taken by this idea of t tensions or synergies between content and mode. Um, and this might not have been necessarily what you were getting at Ernesto, but I think, access as an idea is really important in medieval studies generally both in the text themselves and in trying to read back so for example i work on a lot of um you know anonymous writing for women that maybe appears in one manuscript and i quite like to draw some conclusions from those um pieces of work about attitudes that might have been more general or how people are responding but i you know there's in terms of readership who had access to these texts, where do they go? And of course, there's lots of um, really important work done on provenance and movement of texts, but sometimes you just don't know. And, um, you know, Gwen in the Green Knight being a really um, obvious example, it's one manuscript, but we, you know, draw huge conclusions from it. So I think um, kind of access is an issue when thinking about medieval studies anyway. And in terms of water in medieval studies, um, it feels, again, just, quite pertinent to me like that it feels like there's a, a sort of intuitive connection between open access and water water is something that sort of you know can can create barriers but also can connect and you know if you think about the pearl poem for example the water is both uh, sort of metaphor for um distance and also connection so um again a loose interpretation of your question but i hope you'll forgive me <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much both. And uh, Ernesto says thank you very much for that as well. So um, one of the things that uh, I think you mentioned earlier, Heta, a question from me now, if that's okay, is uh, you, you mentioned or gestured towards the idea about how thinking about water in medieval times uh, can influence or affect how we think about water today, which I thought was a fascinating concept because obviously, you know, it's a, it's a perhaps the most um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's a theme with possibly the most longevity on the planet. I'm not sure there's any sort of more uh, or older sort of things that will connect us and water. So I thought it would be interesting to see from both of you how you think the, that what we can learn from medieval water studies affects what we think about water today, either academically or beyond. That's such a good question. I need a moment to think. James, do you have a response? Weirdly, I've actually started writing all my articles about medieval studies with a pivot. So like I like one of the first articles I ever wrote with a colleague who's an environmental historian was about 
pre-modern streams of thought in 21st century water management. So sort of we you know, historical beliefs that have come to haunt us, even in settler colonial context where it's been moved far beyond its, the idea's original context. So I got into that kind of pivot from the medieval to the modern quite quickly in my career. And I often start all my work now with a pivot because um, I, I mean, I, I feel like that's where I'm most comfortable, the, the medievalisms of things, you know, the, the continuous recreation of the medieval in the, the, pleasant, the pleasant, the present. Um, uh, I, so I, I've actually, I kind of, that's my, where I might feel most comfortable in medieval studies because I've, I'm almost drift, I drift back and forth away from and towards medieval studies. But the thing that always keeps me anchored in it is that I always end up in areas of research where the medieval, you can't get away from it because the physical traces are there, they're inscribed on the landscape. The ideas keep coming back to plague you or to remind you of things, which is an ironic turn of phrase given like a lot of the work that's going on at the moment, um, you know, with uh, the history of uh, the, Black Death, bubonic plague, and some of the research that's been done about linking that to, you know, so we're in a phase where the medieval becomes the modern very quickly. So I, I've always found that a kind of natural pivot. Yeah, and I suppose in terms of what I've sort of learned or what I think we could learn from um, sort of medieval attitudes towards water is this constant awareness of its power. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's tons of really innovative ways in which people are trying to sort of manage and coordinate water and sort of domesticate it um, in the Middle Ages. But there's also like in the writing that I've um, encountered this constant awareness that that, that that could break free, that it has this real power and energy. Um, that we need to be mindful of and I, and you know I think recent events even in the last year terrible floods all that kind of thing you know we we need to sort of give water a little bit more agency in our conceptual thinking about it um and I suppose in a slightly more um fluffy answer I've learned quite a lot from medieval water studies in terms of um its community I've never felt so supported by any sort of area of research I kind of fell into thinking about water doing my MA and I've been you know James was talking about what's anchored him what's anchored me not in medieval but in sort of water studies is the sense of community always and the sense of experimenting pushing boundaries trying to find new ways of thinking new methodological approaches um, I'm constantly excited by the work that's being done and I don't know why that is but it seems to be a magnet for that kind of research so that's what kind of keeps me um, interested in the water and what I'm constantly learning from my own practice um, sort of as an academic and also as a lecturer I suppose. Brilliant thank you both for your responses there so uh, I can see we're coming up to the hour now and I'm aware that people will have to probably go uh, for uh, kind of extra online meetings uh, and so on as we reach the hour so I think probably unless anybody has any other burning questions I can see thank you so much there from Martin and James, thank you. Uh, thank you to our speakers. If you've joined me at home, giving these guys a big round of applause for doing such an awesome job. Uh, and I hope that these conversations continue. Um, uh, and so thank you to you all for joining us. Uh, it's been brilliant, I think, in very strange times to be able to connect uh, with you all here. Uh, good luck everyone in the circumstances that you find yourselves in at the moment. Uh, and we wish you a good week and stay safe, everyone. And thank you again, James and Heta. I don't know if you want to unmute and yeah, say bye. Thank you so much. And thanks, Rose. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, I think this will be the first of several uh, like options like this for, for conversations. Yeah, thanks, everyone, and for your contributions. And thanks for organising. Um, and stay safe, everyone, as well. Thank you so much, guys. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. <laughs>